Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to DevOx. This is our session, Say the Words, Modern Java with JavaFX and Graal VM for Rich Client UIs. My name is Paul Anderson. My name is Gail Anderson. And we're with the Anderson Software Group. Okay, Gail and I are the co-founders of the Anderson Software Group. This is a, uh, a training company based in the US. And we have a lot of courses that we teach. Um, that includes, of course, Java, JavaFX, Python, Golang, modern C++, and Docker and Kubernetes. Gail and I are also the authors of nine textbooks on software programming. And you see two of our books uh, right here. Uh, the, one, the book at the top is our latest book, uh, The Definitive Guide to Modern Java Clients with JavaFX 17. And we contributed a chapter on JavaFX fundamentals, and as well as a chapter on packaging options for JavaFX executables. Our other book that you see below is the JavaFX Rich Client Programming on the NetBeans platform. And Gail and I are also uh, Java champions and Oracle ACE members. OK, here's our agenda for the session today. And we're really glad that you folks all showed up here because we know Brian is giving a talk at the same time, right? Um, we want to begin by talking about why would you want to use JavaFX to do mobile development, right? Um, and so we'll begin uh, with that discussion. And then we want to, um, if you don't know about Gluon, uh, Gluon is a, a company here in Belgium that provides the tools that you need to do mobile development. And that would be uh, Gluon Substrate, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later, and also a really nice plugin for Maven to help you get started. And then we're going to use Oracle's Grawl VM to generate the native images from our source code, you know, all in Java and JavaFX, we're going to use the Oracle's Graal VM to produce the native images for iOS and Android. So that means we have one code base that we can, we can work with and deploy it on these two mobile devices. Now we have two demos to show you today. The first one is Tilt Maze, and this is in the app stores. Okay? And, uh, and when Gail shows it to you, you're welcome to download it and try it if you want. And uh, this, is, this is a neat uh, demo because it uses the accelerometer on your, on your cell phone as you're moving around in a maze. And we, we show you how to do this in a device agnostic way. And then the other demo that we have is a really popular game in America that's uh, on the New York Times. Uh, it's called Wor Wordle. Okay, and I don't know if, if, you, if any of you guys play it, but um, you know, it's, it's a JavaScript program basically on a website that you play. But when we looked at Wordle, we said, boy, this would be a really great way to show people how to do uh, write JavaFX code, because it's got a lot of neat, you know, there's a lot of neat features that we can use in that. And so we'll be showing you that. And there will also, <clears throat> um, and, and maybe some of you know some JavaFX, and if not, then we'll talk about uh, the use of, of Scene Builder, which is another nice tool provided by Gluon right here in Belgium, and, uh, and the use of F FXML markup language. And then we're going to, uh, as we go through the application, we'll be showing you various JavaFX techniques that we thought was really nice and enabled us to um, put this demo together and so forth. And at the end, uh, we'll do a summary. And then for Q&A, um, uh, Gail's going to bring up um, uh, this uh, Slido tool that everybody's been using. Um, you're, uh, what you can do uh, is uh, during the talk, or uh, you can um, type. You, you know, if you if you get that QR you, code right there. If you right have there. a phone, use the <coughs> QR code. You'll go directly to the website, and you can uh, type in a question anonymously, so you don't have to stand up and yell at us, and everybody's far away and we can't see. Uh, we're going to be taking the questions at the end, but you can submit the questions at any time throughout the talk. Um, and we'll put this uh, slide up again later in case you think of something and you didn't go to it. Right, and then we'll address your questions at the end, okay? All right. Okay, so why JavaFX on mobile? Well, a critical goal here is what you see. Plat you want to write platform independent source code, you know, one code base, and you want to be able to install that on multiple devices and so forth. And, and so to do this, <clears throat> once again, you're going to need some tools. And I've already mentioned uh, the tools from Gluon um, and then um, the Graal VM to, to let you build native images. But remember that JavaFX is a mature and well-maintained UI toolkit. It's platform independent. Uh, it, um, it targets not only uh, for mobile, iOS, and Android, 
<clears throat> but you can also do desktop applications and uh, run them on Mac, Linux, or Windows, all portable. Uh, you can even run uh, JavaFX on embedded systems like the Raspberry Pi and also the uh, Macs that have the Apple M1 chip. JavaFX is nice to work with. It's a very nice UI toolkit. It has a rich set of UI controls. It also has charts to visualize your data. Uh, you, it also, JavaFX has a different approach than Swing. It has a uh, scene graph metaphor that lets you manipulate nodes. And, uh, and then to separate the view from the controller, which is always a good idea when you're doing UI designs, uh, there is a FXML markup language uh, so that you can, um, you know, you work, uh, put your layout in FXML in the markup language, and then an FXML loader will parse the FXML file and then produce, instantiate uh, the, con the objects for the controls and configure them, so you don't have to do that in your, yourself in Java code. There's also a nice uh, concurrency library in JavaFX that supports the asynchronous uh, background executions, and, and you need this to keep your UIs responsive. So, uh, and there's a JavaFX application thread too, just like there, there is in Swing. Uh, and JavaFX, one of the things that we really like about JavaFX is it has observable properties, which, again, if you know JavaFX, you know that an observable property is wrapping a field, but you, uh, but you can notify somebody that has registered that you want to know when that field updates. And in JavaFX, we can write uh, listeners to get callbacks, right? So we can write a, a change uh, listener or an invalidation listener. But what's really nice is that you can use these binding techniques where you can take a property, and, uh, an observable property in JavaFX and say dot bind and then bind it to another property so that property will update when another one does. And you can do it um, um, bidirectionally or, or unidirectionally. And we'll, we'll show you some of the, how nice that is in UI designs when we get to the code. Uh, the advantages um, that you, th and remember that uh, you know, JavaFX is Java APIs, so you can use all the modern Java that you know, streams, lambdas, and some of the new features too, like records and the enhanced switch, switch syntax. And remember that JavaFX is maintained by Gluon in partnership with Oracle, and uh, Gluon has commercial uh, LTS licenses too. Okay, talking a little bit about Grawl VM. Uh, again, this is uh, an Oracle framework. And there's a lot of talks here at, at DevOps uh, with Grawl VM too, by the way. Um, and, and although a lot of people are using Grawl VM to create native executables for their Java applications, you know, once again, we're using it for the, in the mobile space because it, does, it works for, um, you know, for us getting the, our, our programs deployed to um, uh, you know, iOS and Android. Now there's two compilers in Grawl VM, a JIT compiler, uh, which uh, gives you a high performance JDK um, that helps speed up your, uh, your, your applications in Java. And then there is the AOT compiler, ahead of time compiler. That's the one that we're using because we want to be able to take our Java code base and do an AOT compile on it and then, and then we have the native images that we can download to the phones or, or, and, the, and the devices. Uh, the reasons why you want to use Grawl VM, I, I, there's a lot more than, than what I'm showing you here, but it, it lowers your application latency, improves uh, your throughput, and it also reduces your garbage collection times. And native images are required for the mobile targets. Right. So. Yeah, you can't have a, a VM running on a mobile device. Right. Okay, here's a, a block diagram that shows you all the pieces that you need to put together a mobile application with this approach. In the middle, you see the Gluon substrate um, component uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the plugins that are there. And on the left, you have your Java application and your uh, dependency, like your POM file if you're using Maven. And underneath the substrate uh, block there, you see the, uh, the use of the Java SDK, the Java FX SDK, and then underneath that is the Grawl VM AOT compiler that we're using. And then, of course, you know, you'll need some libraries to access the hardware for the devices, and, and those are provided by Gluon, so, so you have those as well. And then on the right side, you can see that you can take your application, and you, uh, you can take your mobile application and run it on the desktop uh, to debug it and test it, and then, uh, and then you can uh, you know, create the native images for an iOS and Android. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Gail now, and she's going to show you um, uh, the demos that we, that we have for okay, you. So the 
Hi everyone. The first demo I'd like to show you is Tilt Maze, and this was a proof of concept um, application. I, I wanted to to use an application that used the underlying hardware device in a device agnostic way, and I also wanted to see what work level was uh, required to get it from an idea into the app store. So um, I have it running on my ancient iPhone here, and then I also have it running on a, uh, almost as ancient, no, this is a, a Google uh, Pixel 6, I guess. So this is an Android phone, and this is an iOS devo device. So same JavaFX source code. Um, just to show you if you'd like to, uh, here it is in the Google Play Store, if you'd like to look at it, download it, play with it, and here it is in the Apple App Store, and um, look, I got a five-star review. Yay. <laughs> One review. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this uses uh, the device acceler accelerometer. We use an animation loop. It's, it's a pretty simple game. You control this this little ball through a maze. You don't want to uh, put it into any of the blue holes, and you want to get it into the green holes. Uh, we use Gluon Mobile, which is the Gluon uh, Mobile specifically skin controls. Um, it's licensed, but you don't have to use glue on mobile. We just wanted to use it for this application. Um, we use FXML to keep the view and controller separate. It has collision detection, which is how it controls the ball. So it has to know where it, the, the barriers are and where the holes are. And so in the animation loop, we, we have the usual math that does that. And we use property bindings. So um, I'm just going to run it. Okay. Now I'm going to run it. <clears throat> on my desktop. IntelliJ. So, IntelliJ. Yeah, yeah the, I'm using IntelliJ here. So um, obviously my desktop does not have an accelerometer, but the desktop using compiling your code, just using the regular JIT compiler and JVM is a great way to do initial high-level debugging of your UI because um, the edit uh, compile run cycle is, is pretty quick. So um, let me... So I'm using, this is a Maven project, Gluon FX is the Gluon plugin, and the run command does the, the regular um, JVM build. So, <clears throat> so this is what it looks like. Um, and so we detect that, oh, there's no accelerometer, so we just use mouse input so we can start the game. And it's actually much easier to do on the desktop Except it's actually it's actually quite hard to do this on your phone. You except uh, when yeah. I'm kind of nervous, you know. I'm <laughs> anyway, so th it's really simple, and you can you can adjust the um, the level uh, you, as you become more expert. The ball rolls faster. The time there's a timer, so you have to do it with a certain time. That reduces, and novice you get more time, and the ball goes slower. So um, try to vary it that way. So that's it. Okay, and the second demo that we're going to look into a little bit more is um, Wordish, and it's, as Paul said, it's based on the New York Times game Wordle, so it's kind of like Wordle, but it's, it's, it's not in the app stores, it's more of a demo, um, it doesn't do all the things the Wordle does, like um, it doesn't uh, persist your games when the game is over, everything goes away. But um, <clears throat> I was really struck when I, I play Wordle myself with, oh, this would be perfect for a JavaFX game. It's simple. Um, the ana it uses high-level animation. Um, it has some great opportunities for CSS styling. Um, and we use the uh, Iconly font library, a third-party uh, font library for the nice um, buttons and controls. So I'm going to... And both these games are, the source code is on GitHub, which we will show you. So we're going to go back to IntelliJ and go, oops. Okay.
Okay, so the nice thing about this when you're running it <clears throat> on the desktop and especially in a demo is that it tells you what the word is. And one of the biggest differences <laughs> <laughs> between this and the, re and the real Wordle is that uh, the real Wordle has a very curated list of words. This one is just user dict words with all the words taken out except for the five letter words. So there's some really strange words. I suppose they're English, but I haven't heard of a lot of them. Yeah, I've never heard of this word, Kohol. So my favorite um, first letter is this. And so this is the high level animation where you can do uh, rotates and uh, and also you notice that as the answer comes out the styling changes so we're going to show you about this and let me do another one <clears throat> and then finally what happens when we actually get it right okay so this is what I call the happy dance and we'll show you about that so let's go back slides. Okay, so now um, what I'm hoping is that many of you are saying, oh, this looks like kind of a fun thing to do. How do I get started? How do I do my own mobile app using JavaFX? So as, a, as Paul said, Gluon uh, is a maintainer of JavaFX, and they have, a really, they have really good documentation, but they also have this really nice um, start page. And you can customize all the application details. You see it uses the latest, JobFX 21. Um, Glisten is the licensed uh, mobile uh, plat uh, skin controls that I use for Tilt Maze. I didn't use it for Wordish. So if you want it, you click it. Uh, Afterburner is a minimalist dependency injection, which I find very useful. They have Connect, which allows you to load d uh, data resources. They have a maps library. CloudLink allows you to connect your enterprise to the client application. And then down here, attach. This is what we use for accelerometer. We said, yeah, we want to we wanna access the hard underlying hardware accelerometer. So they have, Gluon has an attached library in which they uh, allow you to access the underlying hardware in a device agnostic way. So once you choose the um, features that you'd like, you can preview the project. And this is helpful. It's a Maven project. The README file gives you all the Gluon FX commands that you can use to build it. Um, and the uh, Gluon FX run is what, we, what I used to show you. But there's the uh, desktop, which you build native run. And then there's targets for Android and iOS. It shows the Java FX 21 modules that it will create dependencies for, as well as the Gluon features we've chosen. And then um, the POM file is uh, <clears throat> generated for you and with all the latest dependency numbers. So once you've decided that's what you like, you can click Generate Project, and it downloads a zip file to your local machine. And then you can open the project in your favorite IDE. So I have a couple other resources to share with you. The other thing you'll need is the Gluon specific uh, <coughs> release of the Graal VM uh, Community Edition. And their documentation sh um, shows you where it is, but this is it. So you download this as you would a normal JDK and set your Graal VM home uh, environment variable. Again, the documentation tells you exactly how to do that. And one other resource, Gluon has a great page with samples. So these samples all use uh, JavaFX, and some of them are real simple, hello world type stuff, and others are more complicated um, <coughs> applications. So I would recommend, if you're interested in that, to just download all of the code and peruse the ones that are of interest to you. You can learn a lot. And then finally, uh, oh, I think I have this. Oh, I'll just go here. Fuji. Yeah. yeah. So I wrote a three-part article that's on Fuji of how you go from idea to app store. And I used the um, Tilt Maze example. 
mostly because, um, it, it, again, we were accessing the, the underlying hardware device. It's in three parts. The first part, I talk about um, some of the Java that we use to access the accelerometer. I gave links to the app stores. The second part is what you need for each target. So for iOS, you need a Mac, you need to be an uh, Apple developer, uh, download Xcode. Uh, for uh, the Android, uh, you need Linux in some way, although you can use um, GitHub Actions for some of this, which I don't have a lot of experience and I didn't go that route, but um, anyway, I explained exactly in these articles what I needed and what I did. And then the third part, I talk about how you upload these uh, applications to the various app stores. Each store has their own rules, they have signing, and Gluon helps you a lot, the documentation helps you a lot getting through that too. It should be easier, I think. <laughs> Okay, so the way we got started on, on, on the Wordish application was, was with Scene Builder. Okay, That's, this is a drag and drop tool from Gluon. So you can um, you know, design your, your UI, and, and that's how, how we put the Wordle application together. And remember, uh, Scene Builder is a drag and drop tool that generates FXML. It doesn't generate Java, it generates this markup language that you can use. And, um, and it's really, really nice because when you take this approach, you're, not going, to be, you're, you're going to be writing less Java code because you're not going to be instantiating the controls and calling the setters to configure them, right? It's all going to be done through the FXML uh, declarative language. The other nice thing about Scene Builder is you can customize your own controls, uh, which you'll probably want to do in, in a lot of mobile apps. And as Gail indicated, you can also load in your own font libraries. So uh, we've got the, the layout controls that we used for Wordle. We have a grid pane that for the button controls and title. We have a title pane for the letter labels. And we're using a flow pane for the virtual keyboard that you saw. So Gail's going to show you a little bit of Scene Builder and FXML right now. OK, so um, <clears throat> from the IDE, you can access Scene Builder. And we have our XML file. Let me see if I can. Get it down here. It's under resources. And let's bring it up in the editor. And you can see this is FXML. Uh, and you can see that it would be pretty messy and frustrating to have to create your scene by typing in these. Um, you can edit this directly, but we have Scene Builder to help generate this code, and that's what we used for Wordish. And there's two ways to get there from IntelliJ, either this tab here, but that goes into the editor window, which I find a little bit constraining. You can also um, pull it up through the um, file itself, uh, open in Scene Builder. And, um, okay, here we are, a little bit less space in this. Okay, so um, Scene Builder is provided by Gluon uh, for free. And um, here you can see this Wordish looks a lot like Wordish. Um, so he, the, the, um, Paul mentioned the grid pane layout. So we have a V box at the top because this is laid out in a vertical area. Uh, the, the grid pane is here. It's a three by two grid pane. We have the buttons at the top and then the title. The tile pane is a um, consistent um, grid equal size cells and that's where we hold the, the letters of the, that you see. And the letters are a specialized class. So if you loaded Scene Builder with this um, uh, FXML file, I wouldn't know what it was. We had to tell Scene Builder. Uh, letter label is um, a class that's based on an extends label, and we added a property called letter display that allows us to change state. When the state changes, the colors change. Okay, and then down below where the virtual keyboard is, this is a flow pane. And again, we have a customized class here that's based on a <coughs> based on a button, extends button, and we have the same kind of, uh, let's do match, issue where the, uh, the uh, <coughs> property 
when you when you change the state of the property, its underlying CSS changes. Okay, so great. How do we? How did we? customized scene builder. So we compiled our customized classes into a jar file and loaded them into scene builder in the library. It's really easy to do that. And then for the Iconly font library, we just give it the repository um, <clears throat> details and it goes and gets them and installs them in our uh, scene builder. So that's just a quick overview. Uh, uh, the inspector on the right lets you change properties, and this library of controls lets you drag and drop controls, layouts into your scene. So we're going to quit this, and we're not going to save it. Yeah, you don't want to save it. I'm going to go back to the slides. Okay, now a little, a little while ago I told you how neat the uh, property bindings are in JavaFX, and, and, and we find this very, very useful when, we're, when you're doing UI designs. So uh, JavaFX has properties that you can bind to. Um, you can, if you need to get to a lower level, write listeners, um, and, and again, you can write a change listener to get a callback when a property updates, or you can get uh, an invalidation listener um, for, for the same reason. But if you use the binding that we're going to show you in a few minutes, um, it's much more succinct, you'll make less errors, and uh, you know, it'll, it'll be faster for you to develop some of the co complexity that UI uh, state uh, state situations come up with. And of course, when you're doing games like we're doing or, or, or things like this, you know, you need to make sure that the state of your game is consistent and that and property bindings really help you do that. Um, the, uh, there's, there's two very large libraries uh, that have binding expressions that are already uh, uh, developed for you and you hook into those with the builder pattern. Um, you know, uh, besides dot bind, here are some logical expressions that we just put in here to show you. Dot less than, dot or, dot e is equal to. And so what we're going to do now is Gail's going to show you um, some of the, how, how we run Wordle and then the property binding that makes that work and you'll see that right now. Okay, we're going to go back to our controller code and <clears throat> and bring up, we're going to bring this up just. Okay, so this is just one example. We usually use property bindings um, in multiple places throughout this code, but just we wanted to show examples. So key letters is, is a map that holds the um, virtual keyboard, which are buttons. And we just want to uh, put a binding on each one of them. And, it, it's, it's, it, and we're binding it, the disabled property. So we're extending buttons so all the... All of the uh, properties that button has, we have. And so when I when I um, I'm here, I'm defining when I want the button disabled. So you can uh, type in um, uh, type in thing. Right now, it's disabled because there's three situations. The first is while you're processing a word. So while you're you've you've typed it in, you hit return. It's processing the word. We don't want you to type in anymore. Uh, or if the row is filled, it's disabled, or if the game is over. Right now the game is over, so it's been disabled. So here you see we're using uh, processing word is, is simply a Boolean, but it's a, it's a JavaFX property Boolean. Um, <coughs> and, the, and we're looking, and we're using Boolean expressions, a dot or, an is equal to, or a dot or. So it's very, uh, flexible, the binding expressions that you can come up with. You can combine things. You can you can translate uh, proper uh, certain types of properties into other properties. And if for some reason the built-in binding expressions don't do what you want to do, uh, you can write your own with custom binding. So it's very very flexible. So just a little taste of that. Okay, the next uh, JavaFX technique that we wanted to talk about is something that is a little more advanced use of JavaFX. It's called pseudo classes. Okay? And it's an under the hood kind of feature that is used throughout JavaFX. But specifically, uh, what you can use a pseudo class for in JavaFX is to specify CSS styling of a control based on the state of that control. 
And, and you know, you can see in Word, Wordish that the states of these keys is always changing, right? So we want to be able to control the specific CSS styling for that, right? And that's where these pseudo classes come in really well. So uh, if you want a button to be less opaque when it's disabled, you can have a pseudo class uh, assigned to that. And in Wordish, uh, the property called letter display that we use is using these letter label and key button classes, but they are th then using uh, the pseudo classes, which then affects the CSS styling that you see. And then we have a separate uh, style.css file that where we define uh, you know, what these styles are for the various states. So Gail's going to show you some of the pseudo classes now. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> whoops, yeah, here we go. Uh, Got to find the right li line number. Okay, so when I was showing you some of the, um, <clears throat> the uh, classes in Scene Builder and I clicked on them and I changed the state, you saw that the color changed and that is happening through the pseudo classes. Here in this line, I'm simply changing the state of this property of letter display. That this is this custom pro uh, JavaFX property that we added to our customized um, class. So we're just changing the state here to the, the match result. We went through and did the matching and it, we got a result. So this is just an example of changing the state. Um, <coughs> letter label is the um, customized class. So. So you can see here extends label. And here we're, um, it's, since it has, we've added a couple properties, JavaFX properties has an invalidated method that gets called automatically uh, when the state changes. And, it, and you, normally you don't need to do anything with that, but for pseudo classes you can uh, override it and then you can set, based on the new value, you can uh, set its pseudo class. So, or its value here, it's just an enum value that we're setting here. Then finally, letter style is what de defines our pseudo classes. And you can see here, and this is, by the way, uh, scaffolding that JavaFX provides for you. So you just need to use it. And JavaFX uses it throughout. So for, I think Paul gave an example, if you, if you have a button, by default in JavaFX and you disable it, it becomes less opaque. So you don't write in your code, you don't change the opacity, it gets done under the hood for you with the pseudo classes. So here we're changing the color uh, of our different, um, of, the, of the control and we're using these different classes with plain displaying no match. And these classes then are in um, our uh, our CSS class. So if we go down here, for example, matching is a style, <coughs> and here we've defined it, and we've defined it with not um, <coughs> built in colors, but we refer to the colors up at the top, which gives us a little bit more flexibility. Um, it's nice here that IntelliJ tells you what the colors look like, but we, we could change these colors and all of a sudden the behavior, our entire application would change. So instead of dark gray, yellow, and green, we could use red, white, and blue, and those would, would correspond to the matching, no matching, and partial, partial matching of the tiles. So the advantage is, and, and when I set out to do this, I wasn't really intent on using pseudo classes. I just looked around and said, oh, you know, we need a little bit of help here. So the advantages of using pseudo classes are that you don't pollute your JavaFX code with CSS styling. And you can change the look, how the state manifests by just changing the CSS file. And this helps isolate the look of your application from its state. So it's, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Okay, a real fun part of JavaFX is doing animation. And uh, JavaFX has two ways to do animation. 
Uh, you can do, uh, you can be at a low level and use keyframes where you really kind of run the whole show for what, what you want to do with the animation. But JavaFX also has APIs uh, that we used here, uh, the animation, tran uh, the transition APIs. And uh, what, what you do with these APIs is you take a node in the scene graph and you operate on that node in some way, like you move it or you change its opacity or something like that. So here are the five um, the tra uh, tra uh, transition uh, animation APIs that we used in, in Wordish. Uh, we use translate transition to move um, a node when we need to. We use fade transition to change the opacity of, the, of a node. And then, of course, we, uh, you, you know, we have some things that are rotating. So we use rotate transition, which you can use to rotate a node in 2D or 3D space. And the really cool thing about this that you'll see in a minute is that if you have multiple transitions, you can run them in parallel all at the same time, or you can run them sequentially one at a time. And parallel transition will run them um, at the same time, if all your transitions that you tell it to, and sequential will run them one at a time. So now we're going to show you how we use some of the animation in the Wordish app. Okay, we've got to go back to controller. Okay, animate bad word. That's always a fun one. So um, <clears throat> we're going to run another game here. See, that's another difference between this and Wordle. You can run as many games as you want to. In Wordle, it's once a day. Okay, so um, I'm going to put in a couple of, I'm going to use the same words, words just because um, it looks a little better from what I want to show you. <clears throat> okay, bad word. Well, here's one bad word. And it, it's not the normal thing of bad word. It just means it's not in our list. So Fritz is not in the list. So when I, when I hit return, um, it'll come back with vibrating back and forth. Word is not in the valid word list um, with a little uh, vibration that kind of says bad. You did something bad. But how did we do this? So um, the whole row vibrates back and forth. So what we did is we, for each tile, we created a translate transition. We moved uh, in the x direction, which means horizontally, 20. And if, if the number is positive, you move to the right. If it's negative, you move to the left. Auto reverses go back to the beginning, and cycle count six means go back and forth three times. So, um, and that's all in a parallel transition. And and yeah, we build that trans, we build that um, transition, and then we put it in a parallel transition. So each they're done at the same time. Um, so, no, I, I just did it. Let's go to the next one. Um, okay, so, and this is my animate success group. Um, oh, but I need to know what, what the yeah, word is. Yeah, what's the is. word this time? I've hit it. Hang on. A week. A week. <laughs> Wouldn't have guessed that. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so you're gonna see two things. First, you're gonna see the reveal, which does the rotate of each tile one after the other, and it tells you if the success or not of your submission. And then this is the correct word, so you're gonna see the tiles rotate, and that's what I call the happy dance or the animate success group. So hit return. And you see it happens one at a time. So um, the, the animate success group is, uh, again, we did for the whole row. We do a rotate. We're doing the Z axis by 60 degrees. Again, auto reverse is true. And this time cycle count is four, so it goes back and forth twice. We're creating a sequential transition and put that transition in there and then play it. And then the third um, animation is the animate labor group where we do the reveal. And, and that's a little bit messier because when we do the flip over, the letters would be upside down and backwards. So we want to fade it out so you can't see them upside down and backwards. And you can, I'll let you look at that code yourself. <laughs> Okay, the, the last subject that we want to talk about that's cool in JavaFX is charts. 
Um, the, the charts are, are, are minimal. They, they, they could be better. There could, there could be some other things that you could do with them. But uh, the charts that they give you in JavaFX are, are, of course, a bar, uh, pie chart, bar chart, line chart, and so forth. And since uh, Wordle keeps track of statistics when you play the games, um, part of what they do is they have a bar chart that, that they use to visualize the data. So uh, we put that into uh, this Wordish app here. And uh, this is, allows us to track our guesses uh, in, in the Wordish game. And we're using a horizontal bar chart um, where users can see the game statistics. So uh, the, the bar uh, chart icon in the Wordish app takes you to another view, what we, what we call the statistics view. And this uses a separate FXML file for the layout. And then what we do is we collect the game statistics uh, actually in a singleton object and we display the number of games played, uh, win percentage, current streak, and maximum streak. And then, um, and then below the statistics data, that's where we show all the distribution as a horizontal bar chart. Okay, so we're going to uh, show you now how you can do some ch uh, simple bar charts and, uh, and how we do that in Wordish. Okay, so this is the chart icon, the bar chart here. So it takes us to a separate page. We've played two games. They both took three guesses, so it's not really that interesting. But um, <clears throat> this, we've customized this bar chart a little bit. Um, for one thing, it's horizontal. The default is that it's, that it's vertical, where the bars go up from the bottom. Um, <clears throat> and we had to do, we customized the colors, and we had to do some customizing of the labels. I was Again, I was just trying to make it look like... Uh, the Wordle apps. Um, so let's look a little bit at this. Uh, I want to go up here where we <clears throat> define the bar chart. So um, the the charts uh, package in JavaFX, it's it's very very flexible and is very very customizable. But it's not that easy to use. But it, but because it has a customer, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, so here we have the bar chart, and notice that we don't instantiate it um, because it's annotated with this FXML. And as Paul indicated before, when you have uh, objects that are defined in your FXML file, the FXML loader will define them, will create them and instantiate for them and set any properties that you've defined in the FXML. So we just have to say, hey, bar chart, uh, FXML, and it, it knows where to find it. And you can see there's other, we have other um, uh, objects defined that way. Um, then the only other thing I'm going to show you here is that a bar chart is... Uh, can have multiple series. In this case, we're using only one series, and a series uh, would be an observable list that holds data. There's different kind of data depending on what kind of chart you have. So an XY chart, which a bar chart is an XY chart, um, it's defined this way. <clears throat> and the number string matches the definition of our bar chart. So um, <clears throat> what we have to go through and, and add the data. We're adding it to the beginning of the, the uh, list. So this is with the zero, and then we're adding our new bar chart data here. And then it gets, um, and there's lots of ways that you can get this instantiated. When we bring up the bar chart page, everything's already there. But it's possible if you update the data while that, um, and in, in this application, that wouldn't happen. But I've had other applications where the data gets updated while the chart is displayed, and you have the option of having it updated in real time using animation. You can see the nodes moving all over, and that's pretty cool. Okay. Anyway. Okay. We're, uh, we're going to have some time for questions coming up here. We have so lots of questions. Okay, good. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've got time. Okay, let's summarize uh, you know, what, we, uh, what we did uh, in our session uh, today. Uh, what we did was we showed you that you can indeed do mobile development in Java and JavaFX. Notice that you didn't see one line of Objective-C or, Sw or Swift code uh, for iOS or, or, co or Kotlin for Android or, or anything like that. JavaScript. Or JavaScript, good point. <clears throat> and in, and you can you know it's fun because you know, you're in Java and you have the JavaFX APIs and the toolkit to do that. And then we, uh, we went through two demos. Uh, we spent more time on Wordish than we did on Tilt Maze, but 
uh, you know, there was, Wordish has got a lot more JavaFX uh, features in it um, than, than the Tilt Maze game. And then um, we didn't demonstrate uh, uh, using Graal VM because uh, you know there's a, the build time is uh, enough that it wouldn't it wouldn't really work for us to, to show you a demo of that. But um, you know the Graal VM is just launched from the terminal window and it goes through and it comp and it creates the uh, the native images for you. Just tell it the target right. Do I want iOS or Android? And it uh, compiles everything and brings in all the libraries that it needs and then you can. Uh, upload it to uh, the, the, the device. And along the way, we, we introduced, uh, well, we talked about a number of different JavaFX techniques. Um, we talked about using Scene Builder, a drag and drop tool, again, from Gluon that will produce the FXML uh, uh, declarative uh, file for you so it can instantiate you know, all your, your controls and configure them. Uh, we showed you how cool property bindings are, and, and we went through some examples of, of how that can be really, really useful when you're doing UI uh, designs. And then um, pseudo classes, so you don't have to get bogged down with CSS styling at a real low level, like we, norm like we do a lot in UIs. We can have the pseudo classes handle that for us. And then we showed you a little bit of the animation uh, that we, by demonstrating it in Wordish, and a little bit about uh, how we used a bar chart as well. Okay. So, um, can you bring up our website real quick? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to thank everybody for uh, attending. Um, here's our contact information, emails and Twitter handles. Um, so we'd like to hear oh, from you if you have any questions. questions. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, on our website, uh, on our <laughs> website, you can go uh, and download the slide deck, and then you'll have all the slides that we talked about here, including the links that you might want to look at. And then this is the uh, source code for both of these, um, you know, both of these demos that we talked about. That's up on GitHub. Okay. Um, so, so let's, um, let's take okay. Wait a second. I have to switch over. Yeah, to we'll have to switch over. We here. haven't used the system before, so. Yeah, we actually went to a, a, the Graal VM talk in the morning yesterday and at the end they used this Slido thing and we went, whoa, this is cool. And we went, wow, maybe DevOx uh, provides that for all the speakers and we were wrong about that. So yesterday afternoon in our ho hotel room we, we f brought this up and hopefully it's all gonna, gonna work. Okay, so it's sort of these based on the likes, but um, I wanted to first, a shout out to JFX Central so Dirk Lemon is here. You, he has a website Dirk. in which you can go and look into all things uh, JavaFX, including a lot of very nice third-party controls and libraries. And, well, everything is on the website, so um, have at it. Yep, that's good. Okay, so... Uh, okay, so... Um, I'm coming from the, this mobile development through JavaFX and Java. So I'm not a CSS expert. So if you're asking me why I didn't use CSS animation, I don't know how to use CSS animation. I know how to use JavaFX animation. So I use what, um, what I know. Um, and do I cons did I consider any free alternatives Gluon? Well, Gluon, what, what does Gluon provide? Gluon provides um, the structure so I can create a Maven application and use the Graal VM and create a native image. And this works on both iOS and Android as well as desktop Windows uh, for Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux. So um, Gl what Gluon provides is all the static libraries that I need to create this native image. I don't know how to do that myself. I mean, I'm sure the Graal VN team would know how to do it. But um, so I don't know what their uh, alter. I mean, and Gluon is free uh, unless you want to use their um, mobile skinned applications. But they have, um, you, you might consider, well, why shouldn't I pay for all this work that Gluon is providing <laughs> to create this great system? So um, that's my answer. Okay. Um, so let's. Uh, do you want to do the, does it detect the device type? Oh, uh, where is that? It's 
It's at the bottom of, on your screen. Does does it detect the device type and adjust yes. the screen size? Yes, yes, yes. And in does fact, all that. in Tilt Maze, in Tilt Maze, it turns out that <clears throat> that the accelerometer is almost device agnostic. Actually, Android and iOS perform. Uh, in one direction, you have to multiply it by m minus one. If it's an Android, it just reads the accelerometer opposite. And so I have to say, is this an Android device? If it is, multiply this when I'm moving, detecting how to move the ball, um, multiply it in a different way. Um, but in Tilt Maze, I also uh, uh, scale the size of the maze. So, um, you know, like even these two devices are different in shapes and um, the maze is a, is a pretty set shape and some of them I have more space at the bottom, but a tablet um, is different. So we, we, we uh, scale it so it'll fit in the right device and, and you, can, you can ask for the screen sizes and we use that. Okay, so we have to, we're out of time, we have to wrap this up. So. Um, I, I don't know if we got to all the questions, no, we but didn't. we didn't. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, um, but one more, I'm going to answer this. What will the app size be when using JavaFX GraalVM compared to native Android and iOS? I, I don't think there's any difference because it goes through, it creates a native image. It, um, it, it, GraalVM does a really good job. I, don't, uh, I went to the GraalVM deep dive yesterday morning, and they, they snapshot the heap, and they... They look at everything, all the classes that you call, and they only include the things that you need. So the uh, the size is really small, and I don't know if it's. I don't think that it would be bigger, but it might be smaller. I don't know. Do you, Kevin, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to wrap it up here. Okay. Yep. Sorry. You okay. can you can email us questions. Yep. We, we, or if, we're going to be around if you want to talk to us too. So. Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. And have a great time here at DevOps this week.